I now invite uh, the panel onto the stage. Dr. Arpit Sharma and uh, Dr. Jayanti Ma'am is a se senior pediatric uh, anesthetist here at Child's, uh, Child's Trust Hospital. Her special interests include uh, complex airway procedures and uh, fetal interventions. Ma'am has been part of uh, several exit procedures along with Tirusar. And she's also the mother hen of the OT. She makes sure the team is well fed and happy. So I'll uh, get the slides on. Um, just a few questions. Uh, how many of you had have have had? Uh, uh, this is more for the Dr. Ravi sir, sir is joining our panel. Sure. Dr. Ravi Ramalingam needs no introduction. Uh, he sought after a global superstar cochlear implant surgeon, my teacher. And uh, he was conferred the coveted FRCS degree by the Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, uh, for his contribution to otology. Uh, gone are the times when he was known as Professor K.K. Ramalingam's son. These days, when there are surgeons visiting from around the globe, the senior Dr. Ramalingam beams with pride and introduces himself as, I'm Ravi's dad. So, welcome Dr. Ravi. Your name's not there because there was a little bit of a doubt. <laughs> so, we have uh, esteemed panelists, Dr. Um, Arpit Sharma and Dr. Bala Ramchandran, whom we heard um, this morning, as well as Dr. Kamran Syed from yesterday, his lectures we heard, and of course, Dr. Ravi Ramlinga. Welcome. So, uh, we'll be doing looking at three cases. The first one is a simple tracheostomy, and a lot of the issues with that have been actually covered. Dr. Bala, do you have the point? Okay. So this is the first case is a 12 year old child who is admitted to the to our PICU with acute encephalitis. The child has been ventilated for 18 days with minimal pressures, was on steroids and immunotherapy. Now the PICU uh, is requesting for a tracheostomy. Incidentally, the child has neurogenic strider was extubated and reintubated twice in an attempt to wean and the reason for referral is poor neurology and difficulty in weaning. Now I'd like to ask the panelists if you would do anything further if you have been asked to come to the ICU to evaluate this child for a tracheostomy, would you do anything further before planning a tracheostomy or would you just go ahead? Um, let's start with our ENT surgeon Dr. Cumbran. Uh, any child who's going to theater for a tracheostomy uh, for po I mean post intubation for a tracheostomy I think it's uh, very easy for us to just pop a laryngoscope pop a Hodgkin's telescope and uh, look at the larynx uh, considering that this child was intubated for 18 days and uh, had post extubation strider and was reintubated I think it's definitely worth having a look at the larynx Okay, so we heard these messages yesterday from Dr. Carlin as well and he reiterated that uh, even though you are expecting it to be a neurological problem, you must evaluate if there is something else. Dr. Ravi, would you like to add? Yeah. So, um, so when would you consider a tracheostomy in the pediatric population? Has there been a consensus on timing for tracheostomy? Uh, can I ask Dr. Arpit? So, again, it's a very difficult question to answer because, again, it all depends on the ICU protocols as well. But having said that, usually ICU people, in the especially in the pediatric age groups, they prefer to keep the tube for a long period of time. And a good thing is the, uh, the pediatric age group is less forgiving also and they tolerate the tube also for a long period of time. But again, coming back to this, most important thing here is the why the trachea, why the intubation is done and what is the primary condition of the child if he is going to require ventilation for a long period of time it is a, a good decision to convert that to a tracheostomy earlier and if you are expecting any kind of uh, improvement you can withhold it also for two to three weeks also and uh, if at all if you are doing earlier how it helps is like you can always wean the child of ventilator faster you can decrease the sedation child will be more alert and it can be uh, eventually kind of uh, uh, go to a SDU and subsequently to the wards also. Yes. So, Dr. Bala, would you like to add? I think you must no, I be think at the other I end. I completely agree. The there is no hard and fast rule saying that you have to do tracheostomy 
after so many days it all depends on the underlying pathology do we think that this child is going to get better soon uh, then we would wait if we know that this child is not going to get better soon then why wait you know you like so uh, is there an early period when the outcomes are better in terms of like you know this child is going to take a long time this child needs a tracheostomy for a long time we'll so do it early you know we can counsel the fa- uh, within the week. first week yeah. within the first week okay. if we know this is going to be a long term uh, uh, issue you know we'll yeah. do it in the first week because you can get the child home faster sure so uh, i think this question has been answered by dr arpit in his lecture what uh, tracheal rings would you lose use and yeah sure I was just wondering that that there are some children who are sort of uh, fence sitters in the sense you are not sure whether they are going to you know uh, require uh, intubation for a or ventilation for a longer time or for a shorter time so is there a fixed number of uh, extubation trials that you give before you plan on a tracheostomy or you know usually it all depends on the you know the child obviously do one extubation child fails then i would probably do one more extubation and tell the family that you know we're going to try once more so that they also don't think that we're rushing into a procedure okay and uh, then we say if this child fails and uh, we get an airway exam done so we can have a better idea of why this child is failing is there any physical problem that can be solved or no it's because uh, you know the child uh, have can't handle secretions etc yeah. um, uh, you know poor mental status or whatever it is then the child we have demonstrated to the family and very often we will have the family there when we extubate the child okay so that they also understand the necessity they when they see the child struggling to manage secretions desaturating and then all the interventions then go on the buy in for tracheostomy is much better sure uh, the other thing in addition to what sir said is uh, probably that's unique to our setup in india is uh, one is cost and other is bed availability if you have got a acute crunch for beds someone you might keep uh, intubated for another week you might think of doing an early like the fencitor you might do a track whereas if you're not really stressed with finances and the beds you might sit for another week and decide yes sir very rightly said because in india everything a lot depends on the economics i'm uh, just sort yeah. of point to make uh, sir had a valid point of uh, two uh, extubations and then probably i'll go for a thing but uh, some children we actually actually i had uh, four patients four, four ch- children who were extubated but then went into respiratory uh, distress after two days now every time when you extubate and do a flexible scopy the subglottis the glottis the vocal cords looks very normal but after two days they go in for strider so it's it's not a very uh, like dr bala will say it's not a very simple process so it needs a lot of maybe yeah, they should true. be in the icu and be on no these cases what weaning uh, mode or something yeah these cases what happens is uh, the tracheostomy i mean the endotracheal tube actually stents the cricoid region so immediately after your extubation the subglottis looks very fine but after two days when the edema sets in Th- that's the time when the yeah. strider comes in and uh, probably after two extubations we probably needs to think about tracheostomy in these childs and then uh, evaluate the subglottis after a week or so yeah uh, no i c- that happens all the time um the after you remove the tube they're okay then edema sets in etc and then it's nice to get a quick look uh, before you reintubate them if yeah. you can if they're not that bad they're holding on you know we uh, we usually put some positive pressure on these children it helps very nicely to uh, stent the airway open and it's nice to get a look if you can before you put a tube back in so that you s- know why this child is f- uh, failing is it uh, an issue of uh, uh, stenosis forming or is it glottic edema or is something else is there malaria whatever so we we phrase these icu children in two theses and what we found out it was ventilator associated pneumonia causing tracheomalacia long segment tracheomalacia and the common mistake we do is we give bronchodilators which are tracheal's muscle relaxant and they just worsen it so one of the things is to give a 
non invasive ventilation then actually go move on for a repeat tracheostomy or reintubate it but uh, vap associated tracheomalacia is highly highly underdiagnosed agree yes sir thank you for that so we'll move on um so which which type of tracheostomy would you recommend in this child an open or a percutaneous technique when would you prefer a percutaneous tracheostomy? Dr. Arpit, can you go for that? Uh, we will always prefer an open one only because we are doing it in a much more controlled uh, uh, settings. I don't know whether percutaneous tracheostomies are being done in the pediatric age group. No, the Sir, kits aren't available and children are m much more, you know, variable. Insights. It's much harder to do it at the bedside and uh, our ENT surgeons um, will definitely agree. We've done one percutaneous uh, uh, on a bigger child, you know, on like a 16 year old who's almost an adult, uh, but it's much easier to d take it to the theater and do it under controlled circumstances. Uh, world over, I don't think we do many percutaneous tricks in children because, uh, you know, you need a whole variety of sizes. It's not so like one is size. It, is it that uh, if there's a center where you don't have an ENT surgeon available on site, is that an option or? Uh, if there is no ENT surgeon available, I wouldn't put something into the trachea myself. Okay. okay. <laughs> the dilators, uh, because the children uh, have very, uh, my, my. the children have very collapsible trachea, so the dilators itself can actually collapse the trachea if you if you attempt a percute tracheostomy. I think it's it's really not an option. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, even if someone who's done hundreds of uh, adult or older kid percutaneous in his tracks, one is like sir <coughs> rightly said they're not uh, appropriate available size kits available. All size. And uh, again, the challenge is inherent with a pediatric percutaneous in his track. Sure. There is probably two three scenarios where it might be useful. One is in a patient who is on an S1 ECMO. Okay. Like a so, uh, older uh, child on yeah. ECMO where there's chances of older child on ECMO where a trip to OT <laughs> and all might be more tricky and uh, uh, the intensivist the adult intensivist actually so wherever I have worked the pediatric intensivist are per se in their training trick is not included but in uh, everywhere in the west adult intensivists themselves do and I think even in India yeah. adult intensivists do percutaneous tricks so uh, I have been involved in a couple of ECMO patients who are a little bit adolescent where uh, the trip to OT and doing it was much more uh, difficult. So they ended up having a percutaneous trek in the in the ICU while on ECMO. With the uh, ENT surgeon stand by, I suppose. ENT surgeon is always in the hospital. No? So like they're not <laughs> scrubbed and stand. Like I mean, in not in our place. I mean, in the West, I'm saying. They th so it's like you have seen yesterday, uh, uh, the time that takes for an ENT surgeon to come in an emergency is three, four minutes. Like you page stat ENT surgeon, they are there in the West. It's not like ours. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so You're giving a bad name to yeah, intensivists. Some damning okay. uh, suggestions. Anyway, we'll uh, ignore that. That's out of the. <laughs> okay, out of syllabus. So. Um, no, those kids, you can even do a bedside. The ones on ECMO. So airway management, like over the last couple of days, we've seen all very difficult airways, small pinhole meatus and all that. But everything seems to be going very smoothly. What happens if things go wrong? So our next case, you will see what happened, at least with us. And you can tell us what sh we should have done. So I get a call, an emergency call from the newborn fellow in the emergency room. There's a two-day-old baby shifted with a saturation of 65%. Um, this was uh, around 5.36 in the evening when we were just finishing a major neurosurgery list and uh, she said that I'm not able to intubate and uh, already several attempts have me made. That itself gave alarm bells and uh, we had to rush immediately to see the child. On arrival, we found a late preterm, a 3.6 kg baby. Uh, the baby was, uh, what his very brief history she told me was, the baby had strider at birth and uh, was had a saturation of 70%. Heart rate at that time was about 130 per minute. They did an echo at that place and they found there is a report saying just pulmonary hypertension. And then this baby was shifted with the nasal prongs in a just an ambulance which was just like a car. 
straight go to child trust that was the message so this uh, baby was brought with a nasal prongs but um, for whatever reason the child on examination had a strider had a rapid respiratory rate but still had a heart rate and a saturation going at, at some 60 percent now um, how will you manage this child i can uh, address it to any one of the surgeons but i would think this is more like an anesthesia question they would probably <laughs> yeah go ahead <laughs> still i'll take it okay so first of all the patient had already had some intubation attempt so first thing that we should not rush into is try intubate again try to stabilize by either starting on a high flow oxygen like a airvo or a thrive system and uh, in such cases laryngeal mask airway comes really very handy and i think that is one neglected thing that uh, either even the anesthetists and even the ent don't think about they always try to go in for a uh, intubation but uh, lma should be tried in such cases and while we are preparing for the tracheostomy also we should try to prepare for doing a endoscopy if possible if the child permits obviously we have to kind of uh, have to go for a emergency tracheostomy keep everything ready once you have you feel the child is stabilized enough try to go for endoscopy if, uh, even if a quick examination can be done sometime it is just the blood clots and everything even uh, adrenaline pledgets put for a few seconds also may help you in so situations rigid endoscopic examination along with a thinner endoscope like a 2.7 pediatric endoscope with a tube uh, rail loaded on it can also be used if you are able to have a direct look and you can slide in the tube on that it also yeah. can be tried otherwise tracheostomy yeah we'll just get to that so um so what uh, i did was uh, all all uh, difficult airway algorithms in anesthesia we find that the next best thing when you cannot intubate unexpected difficult intubation is to insert a supraglottic airway device now uh, the pro seal lma is available in a size 1 which is for a weight of 0 to 5 kilos and the advantage of this pro seal lma which is a second generation supraglottic airway device is the presence of what's a uh, this is a drain tube which if you insert a nasogastric tube through that it will go into the stomach now in our anxiety to increase the saturation you will find that we hold the mask tight on the child and hyperventilate with very large flows of oxygen and the commonest easy passage is the esophagus and the stomach inflates and most of these children desaturate because of that so if you decompress the stomach and you this is going to be a continuous process you need high pressures you have a very small slit like opening and if you decompress the stomach then you are you are improving the saturation straight away so any child where you have a difficulty you know that there is a narrowing and you are ventilating and there's no improvement think of decompressing the stomach and this this prosil lma is a expensive device but it's really worth having the i gel is a local or a lesser expensive version of that and you do get a size 1 in that as well so this is a pro seal so you see there is a airway tube and there is a, a gastric tube and if you insert a feeding tube through this if this is seated over the larynx you will find this will directly go into the esophagus it also holds it in place it is costing about uh, 15 to 16000 it's reusable it's reusable yeah, yeah. I I didn't realize in anesthesia 15000 is expensive among surgeons and PICU 15000 is cheap <laughs> So what is your next step now that I have very um briefly stabilized the child with just a pro seal lma and some saturation going there is a heart rate we made a newborn uh, doctor stand by in fact we were trying to do some adrenaline neb like he was suggesting but we were too scared to remove whatever device was in so before i inserted the lma i had one look with a video laryngoscope and i found actually bits of tissue from the several attempts at intubation so i could see the cords were fine but there was a narrowing below that so basically so much trauma out of desperate attempts at intubation has has worsened whatever existing condition which i was not sure what it was i did see if uh, uh, i could see a pinhole kind of opening and i 
and the doctor said even a two size tube wouldn't go but i didn't attempt anything i thought the best is to suction and put a pro seal and then take it forward so then we call for a surgeon and uh, true to his word against what sajit is saying dr thiru <laughs> was here in about 15 20 minutes and we could get the ot ready so what would be the next st step dr kamran um, one thing is uh, what i learned from experience this is many many years ago i was in a similar situation yes and things looked okay when i scrubbed in to do a tracheostomy and uh, while i was scrubbing while i was scrubbing in so the anesthetist is paralyzed oh. oh and that was a mess okay so, so saturation yes, drop is bringing up a very important message yeah. that when you have a difficult situation like this try and maintain spontaneous breathing because the child has a natural way of maintaining oxygenation and you don't want to take over that unless you're dead sure that you can establish an airway so do not paralyze when you cannot be sure to intubate so there is a discussion which probably is out of the pretext of this group in anesthesia circles where they say when you cannot intubate or ventilate paralyze which is more for the functional obstructions and not for an anatomical uh, problem like this where actually there is a physically uh, narrowing in the uh, uh, trachea I, i brought this up to highlight that there should be a communication between the surgeon and the anesthetist so we should be on the same page talk yeah. to your anesthetists because their training is airway obstruction paralyze yeah and it's it doesn't work when there is a structural blockage yeah so you need to maintain spontaneous breathing and today we have very good agents which in case the baby is moving a bit as well with sevoflurane it's an excellent drug where it goes in and you can always get it out with the child breathing spontaneously try and maintain spontaneous breathing also you must make sure that you have good iv access and in case there's a problem you can always intervene So the next step in this actually Dr Arpit has already explained he said that you gather the airway team together and plan as discuss a strategy we didn't have much time just a few minutes and the initial plan was to introduce a um, rigid scope or a nasal endoscope or some device just or a, at least a fiber optic this is a picture from some other case which i just put representative just to have a look at what is happening and uh, why would you think that we should go with a scopy rather than directly a tracheostomy doctor sayed uh, one is if time permits uh, it's better to have your colleagues scrubbed in for a tracheostomy okay and at the same time trying to understand what's happening uh uh to see like so what to understand the, the what's understanding happening but of here course is we uh, have a small newborn baby with the airway that has already been manipulated several times there's desaturation and needs an urgent airway and uh, we have seen that there is some sort of narrowing in the trachea yeah. so we want to do a tracheostomy yeah so coming back to that so one is have your colleague like ent colleague like scrub in for a tracheostomy while the second person tries to see what the problem is and uh, try to pass at least a smaller tube so the advantage is like doing a tracheostomy in a newborn it is not very easy trachea is not easily palpable at least if you have something to some reference in the trachea it uh, makes a big difference you can do a much quicker tracheostomy rather than trying to palpate and find a trachea which is hard to palpate which becomes a challenge so at least visually looking at it if the child permits if the child's condition permits it's probably a little safer to do it rather yes, than I doing without a tube you're suggesting we put a, a rigid possible. scope and try and introduse a tube if possible okay yeah so what yeah, tiru so what tiru is doing uh, so lo and behold we put they put in a rigid scope and the child had a cardiac arrest <laughs> No this is not laughing <laughs> matter only I see you laughs so I just want to know how many of you have had a cardiac arrest in OT when you're managing an airway that is so difficult already we are at peak adrenaline and tension about how do we manage how many he I says it's common uh, yeah okay. no it can happen it okay so it was not so common for us and we were like what is the definition totally. of cardiac arrest is it bradycardia <laughs> No this uh, No this child had a bradycardia and a very no has severe bradycardia so, so we had to give adrenaline and, and started chest compression <laughs> 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 
So I think we are lucky or we are <laughs> no, so so the supraglottic is already a one size, and uh, the flexible scope. I'm not sure when. Okay. If it's so only edema, yeah. We can what Tiru is doing, like he's got a, a small 2.7 tube. We can railroad a three size tube and force through the stenosis. If it's like a life and death situation, you can go deal with the subglottis later. Sure. So. Uh, what we do even as the, so the child <laughs> end was arrested and we kind of revived the child so we realized that we go back on to the um, LMA and that was our only hope for ventilation and uh, Thiru started doing a tracheostomy now as he was doing the tracheostomy uh, we have the most experienced ENT surgeon but uh, tracheostomy doesn't happen as fast as you would like it to. So we are trying to maintain saturation. Meanwhile, the child's uh, pulse oximeter goes off and it's showing some 40, 30, and we don't want to discuss those numbers. <laughs> don't bother with us if it's not negative. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then we had, luckily we had some heart rate and we trying to get some adrenaline going. I think now one thing that we are forgetting over here is we can use a rigid bronchoscope also, a smaller size rigid bronchoscope. No, so which what is little they saw in the rigid scope that they did use was a pinhole kind of opening and they were not sure, we didn't have this knowledge from yesterday that you can put a newborn stillet. Maybe the next time we see something like this, we, will try. we tried a two size endotracheal tube that's the smallest we have and it didn't pass. So that's when all the arrest and all this drama happened. So we went back and they did the tracheostomy. Now after the tracheostomy was done, the child didn't seem to improve any better. And how do you assess, um, one of the panelists, uh, Dr. Arpit, how will you assess if, uh, I mean, even the surgeons had a doubt if the tracheostomy is in the right place. So because we did not get a CO2 trace. One is the visual confirmation. First thing is if you are okay. not getting a CO2 trace and if you are sure ke that you have put in again get a visual confirmation ke that you are into the trachea. Second thing in such situation that should be suspected is a pneumothorax, a tension okay. pneumothorax. Yes, that's that a, is a good usual point to think about yeah. because uh, you have been trying to push so much air in and, and it's like if yeah. And I think there is not much of a time in such situation to confirm with the x-ray what you have to do is put in needles and that will also will confirm ki that is a tension pneumothorax and will relieve it as well if that is also not there then i don't know. okay so ARDS. Yeah. ARDS also yeah so in addition to what the panel uh, suggested one thing which i had uh, i mean i had some similar challenging condition here where we put in the tracheostomy tube and we knew it was in the trachea but it was not ventilating we had a problem uh, then i had to actually uh, railroad a uh, infant feeding tube and then push in the tracheostomy tube then it went inside and uh, the airway could be achieved what happened here was when the hurry to push in the tracheostomy tube actually you push it onto the posterior wall the esophagus comes in and it occludes the tip S of so the... So we were seeing that with some change in position, things were improving, then they're not improving and we were really lost what to do. So one of the things that we saw was there was no CO2. So with some adrenaline infusion, things were starting to look a little better. So I would think that one of the reasons, at least in our patient, could have been uh, pul the pulmonary hypertension was significant. So we could not really ventilate. The bag was very tight. So, using the inotropes as infusion and even though we are trying to give 100% oxygen, that could have been a reason. The other reason is when you release an obstructive situation of after a long time, you can get pulmonary edema as well. So, these are some thoughts pulmonary that edema, came to us. Uh, yes, you have, but you have a pink frothy spool, this thing which keeps on pouring this out of your tracheostomy tube. not even sure where uh -huh. the child was. And, uh, anyway. From a surgeon's perspective is like Arpit said, visual confirmation, I would yes. probably pop a flexible scope in through the tracheostomy yeah, so that and was confirm. That's something you can. Uh, yeah. Children, baby, uh, going through the flexible tube, going through the tracheostomy, I think 2.7. You know, it's a bit tricky. Uh, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it's it's a difficult situation. You can put in a rigid endoscope from above and confirm whether it's that in the trachea. Yeah. But yeah. whatever way you, if you can yeah. confirm, yeah. What's available oh, yeah. At that point. The best thing to tie off situation would be to remove it.
didn't put an ET tube through the trigger. ET tube also, yeah. That saves. That's, that's a better idea. You're trying to buy time. And again, when s the last one. Hey, no, 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 this, this, uh, you know, uh, discussion will go on no, and okay, on last and on. <laughs> so, zero, zero, so last is two minutes. Da Dr. Callan is waiting for the next talk. Please finish this. <laughs> so, okay. we'll two get, minutes. get a two opinion minutes. from him. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, okay, so this is a section of pediatrics not addressed in our meeting till now. So, we have, um, if the tracheostomy is not possible in a difficult airway in a fetus. So, we know in all uh, difficult airway algorithms, the final is the surgical tracheostomy. What do you do when you can't do a tracheostomy and it's a fetus? Okay. So, here we have, the, we are presenting an adult in a pediatric meeting, a 23-year-old primary gravida with polyhydramnios. The ultrasound showed that the uh, uh, fetus had a thyroid swelling quite large pressing over the trachea. Now, this is a fetal MRI. It helps to, uh, the MRI in the fetus helps to see. Now, they said the fetal uh, trachea was compressed and it was about 2 to 2.5 centimeters. You can see this is a high definition ultrasound showing that the swallowing is happening here. And above this is the trachea, which again they said was 2.5 centimeters. So, um, the plan by the team was to do a exit procedure, which is you uh, deliver the baby and establish the airway while on placental support. So, it is a 3 kg baby. I will just go very quickly. Head and neck is delivered. The baby remains connected to the placenta. Airway is secured and the baby is delivered. You do not have much equipment for a newborn or a difficult airway in a fetus. Now, all we had to put everything together and Thiru's brains and uh, <laughs> think of something to do. Only individual skill and improvisation. So, you can see the there is a large team um, with varying people at a different center. So, we had a lot of difficulty because it was not our own place. So, the baby's head is delivered. Suctioning is done. And I do not know if the, the I mean the thyroid is not uh, seen, maybe in the next thing it will be seen. So, they were not sure whether to pull the trachea up or push the trachea thyroid down or so the first plan was to attempt an intubation. Plan B was to go with a um, um, stillet and then subsequently we used as suggested here by one of our speakers we used a rigid scope and threaded the tube on it and then the intubation was done. Now, this is just to complete the um, scenario in this airway meeting where you can address issues in the, you can see the, uh, the thyroid here. Yes. And apparently the radiologist said that, that it was a, it is not very rare to see neonatal thyroid and they presented it in their meeting. They had previously lost another patient with a large thyroid, the baby was delivered before they planned the exit. So, the obstetric team was very keen on things. So, the child was started on uh, uh, thyroxine. In fact, pre-op they tried giving thyroxine in the amniotic fluid, but it did not seem to work. But this baby was then extubated and um, did well. So, thank you. Thank you for the panelists. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. That was a very nerve-wracking uh, panel to sit through.